the best piano player in the country, right? Amen. Always, always. This morning I'm going to be talking to mainly all of us old folks. <laughs> but all you young ones, pay attention now, man, because there's good stuff in here for everybody this morning. I'm going to start off and ask you a question. When you were younger, did you ever think that you would live to be as old as you are right now? No. No. I didn't either. I surely didn't. I, I didn't think I'd ever live to be this old. When I was a teenager, I thought anybody that was in their late 30s had one foot in the grave, you know? <laughs> and anybody older than that, well, they were living on borrowed time. But now that I'm a, I'm a senior citizen myself, I kind of understand more about that. You know, I, I'm so old that I have actually dialed a rotary phone while listening to an eight track sitting next to a black and white TV with aluminum foil on the rabbit ears. Is that yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm old enough to have picked up the phone and said, hello, yeah, hi, Mabel, how you doing? You know, oh, we're doing good. How's your mom and them? That's good. But would you ring 534J for me, please? <laughs> <clears throat> had a long time for a rotary phone. And if I'm not sure, that Margaret Margaret's phone number was 534J. I think that was three longs and a short. <laughs> Mine was 534W. I think that was two shorts and two longs or something like that. Anyway, I don't remember all that. But anyway, as I realized, as I get older, I realized that age is kind of a relevant thing. You know, it's just kind of relevant to whoever you are. <laughs> But I think it's more in our mind than it is on our odometers. And I think it's, it's much more than what it states on your birth certificate. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about our age this morning and how we got where we are this morning. If you would please stand with me to Psalms chapter 37, the 37th Psalm. We're going to begin by reading verses 23 and we're going to read through verse 25 this morning. 23 says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord. When he delights in his way, though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Father, we just thank you for our time here together this morning. Father, we just ask a special blessing on each and every one who's here and Father, we, we look into the scriptures this morning. Father, we just pray that we truly understand that you are the almighty God. And that, Father, that down through the years you have been good to each and every one of us. <coughs> and Father, we just uh, <coughs> excuse me, ask you to bless this time this morning. Forgive us when we fail you. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now, the opening verse, I mean, the opening words of this verse here in chapter in the 37th Psalm, any one of us could have written those words because they speak a truth that each one of us knows all too well. I have been young, but now I'm old. I got to admit that, you know, I'm getting older. I don't want to admit it, but I am. I'm getting older. And it's something that, that I, nor you, or anybody else have any, has any control over. Whether we want to admit it or not, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, you and I are getting older. It's just a reality that some people try to run away from. You know, you, that's why you, sometimes you see old men trying to, trying to look and act young. You see old women who are trying to look younger and act younger. <laughs> We've all seen that, you know, you, not so much here in Cooper, Texas, but you go to uh, Sulphur Springs, Paris, especially down the Metroplex, you see all these people, you know, they're old, but they try to dress young, and they're old, but they try to talk young, and they're old, but they try to behave like they're young. <laughs> well, I want to tell you that there's nothing wrong with wanting to keep alive memories of our younger days days when we had plenty of vim and vigor and, and uh, sooner or later though we're going to have to uh, admit that old father time is going to catch up with us and, and we have to say like that old song says you know the old gray mare she ain't what she used to be <laughs> <laughs> the 
If Margaret was here, in here, she'd tell you that I'm a people watcher. I like to watch people. People are the strangest critters on this earth, I'm telling you. <laughs> and it really tickles me when people just absolutely refuse to accept their age or their own age. You know, it's obviously obvious from the lines on their face and the furrows in their forehead that their player and play at days are over with. They have been long over with. But you can't tell them that they're not in the game any longer because they're still trying to convince all of the younger people that they're still young and they still got it going on. But I think if you've gone out of business, you ought to take your sign down. <laughs> There's no sense in trying to keep the business open if all of your merchandise is stale or it's out of date. Right? <laughs> but church, it is. I mean, it's a physical impossibility to escape the reality of old age. I mean, it's a natural progression of life. The alternative is something totally different, isn't it? I'm glad to have gotten this old. But I don't care how many vitamins you take, how well you watch your diet, how much you exercise, you can't stop yourself from getting older. Now, all of these things, they help the aging process, okay? They help the effects of the aging, aging but you're still not going to stop it in any way, form, or fashion. What we really should have done, we should have taken better care of ourselves when we were younger, and we would have had we known we were going to live this old, right? <laughs> this also an impossibility to mentally stop the progression of age. It doesn't matter how much you exercise your mind, it doesn't matter how many herbs that you, natural herbs that you swallow, or how many books you read on memory retention, sooner or later your thought process is just going to deteriorate. And you won't be able to remember people's names and places that you've been, or even what you went into the other room for. I'm old because I fit all three of those criteria. I can't remember anybody's name. Margaret says, you know, remember when we went? I don't have a clue when we went. And every day I find myself standing there, what did I come in here for? Anybody else have a problem? Well, we can, you know, testify. We can really testify that old age brings about change. Well, you know, maybe they may have used to in the past have have called some of you ladies a looker. You know, they may have been called some of you guys, uh, hey, that guy's hot, you know. Now they call you Momo and Pawpaw, -paw, right? <laughs> <laughs> you used to be able to stay up all night. Now you gotta take a nap after lunch every night. You used to be able to run like a deer. Now you walk like a snail. <laughs> you used to be able to eat anything that your little heart desired without fear of indigestion. Now when you eat, you've got to stay up for two or three hours and let it digest before you lay down. <laughs> you used to have to take medicine. You used to never have to take medicine. Now you have to take a pill for everything. You've got to take a pill to make it go down. You've got to make a pill to make it come out right. And I tell you, <laughs> <laughs> old age changes things. <laughs> but David, David in the scripture here, he reminds us of one thing that never changes, that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then if you look back over your life, you have to recognize that down through the years that God has been good to you. David, first of all here, David speaks of, of God's goodness in the past tense. He said, I have been young. In other words, God has been good to me when I was young. Because the places that I went to and the things that I have that, that I did, I could have been killed. But because I was young and I was foolish, I didn't see the danger associated with that club or that party or that particular activity that we were involved in. But God still had his hands on me. God was still good to me. And that stuff that I drank when I was younger, you know, it could have poisoned me. But because I was young and everybody else was doing it, I didn't see the danger that too much of anything is not good for you. But still, God had his hands on me. The people that I hung out with, you know, some of those guys were really not my buddies. 
because they got me in a lot of stuff I wouldn't have got into on my own, but that's what I'm claiming anyway. <laughs> but you know, they, they, when you're young, you don't realize that some people <coughs> are your friend because of what you have. Maybe not necessarily who you are, but when you don't have anything, some of your friends are going to desert you like rats off of a sinking ship, right? So when my so-called friends left me, God kept his hands on me. And that's just kind of in the past tense, but in the present tense, David says, <coughs> I'm no longer young. He says, I'm old now. Well, my hair is turning white. Didn't have any gray hair until I started New Hope Church. And never mind. <laughs> we won't go. There. And my eyesight, my eyesight's gotten dim over the years. My steps have gotten a little slower and a little shorter. But guess what? God's still keeping me. Is there anybody here this morning who knows that God is keeping you? Yeah, we all know that. And if you know that, you ought to touch somebody this morning <coughs> and say, you know, God's keeping me. And when you know that God's keeping you, you've got a great testimony. You can't help but have a great testimony. <coughs> Excuse me. It amazes me, though, how some people refuse to give God praise when it's obviously, it's only the Lord who's keeping them going, you know. Who do you think woke you up this morning? Who do you think directed you to church here this morning? Now, I checked the obituary column this morning. That's what you do when you're older, right? You check the obituary column. And I didn't find anybody's name that's in this room here this morning. God is good, right? You know, you could have arthritis, but God is good. You may have a bad heart, but God's good. May have high blood pressure, but God's good. You may be a diabetic, but God is good. And when you know that God is good, you can't help but say like David says here in this verse, I've seen the righteous forsaken. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, but his seed, nor his seed begging for bread. David, you know, David's not saying in these verses, he said, I'm not, he's not saying I've never been in need. You know, we've all been in need. David's not saying there wasn't in a time in my life when I didn't need a little help. You know, we all need a little help now and again, don't we? And David's not saying there's, <coughs> <coughs> there's not a time in my life when I didn't have to borrow a little money from my friend to make it till my check come in. You know, a lot of people have more bills at the end of the month than they have money left. That's not what David's saying. But David's saying that even through all of that, I never had a moment in my life when God didn't take care of me. But there's all of us skeptics, you know, we say, well, now, never, David, never. Never is a pretty strong word. Never means absolutely, no, there's no absolutely no question about it, or there's never been any evidence to the contrary. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. But I'm telling you, church, God is an awesome God. My grandmother used to say something years ago that I really didn't understand it when I was young. But now that I'm older, I understand what she meant. She used to say, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. Always on time. And I realized, you know, that down through the years, the Lord's been good to me. And when we get ready to go here today, I want you to know that if you can't think of any other reason to acknowledge how good God is, and how good God has been to you. Think about this. <clears throat> God forgive us of our sins through the blood of his son Jesus Christ. You know, we were and we are no good. We may think we're, we're great, but we're not. We're not good people. But the Father sent his good son to pay the price for your sins and my sins and just because of the goodness of Jesus Christ, those who accept him when they die of old age, <coughs> we just, <coughs> I'm sorry, 
when we die of old age, we just simply move from an earthly level of God's goodness to a heavenly level of God's goodness. Amen? Amen. If it were not for the fact that God is good, you and I wouldn't have a chance to go live with God when we die. But thank the good Lord in heaven because he forgives us through the blood of his only begotten son. Now, there's an illustration of forgiveness in a story here, and I want to share that with you this morning. It's about a young man who committed a crime and who was sent to jail. It's a very familiar story. We've heard a lot of times. Back in 1973, Tony Orlando and Dawn had a number one hit song based on a version of this particular story. And there's been a lot of retellings of it <clears throat> since 1973. This guy was a very rebellious young man. He disobeyed his parents and ended up on the wrong side of the law. And the law that he broke sent him to prison for eight years. Now, he knew that his parents were hurt and they were embarrassed by this foolish act of his. And as he sat in the prison, he thought about his mother and his father. And he looked forward to the day when he could go home. And as time passed, he didn't know if his father was going to let him come home. Because all during the time, every letter that he wrote to his father during the prison, <coughs> excuse me, during his time in prison, <coughs> his father had never answered one of his letters. <coughs> excuse me. So he wrote a letter to his mom, and he said, "Mom, in a few days, I'm going to be released from prison." I'm going to take the train that comes by the family farm. <coughs> we may have to continue this next Sunday. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. choke on it. It's a bad part about that. You could choke on it. <coughs> Bear with me. I'll get through this in a second. <coughs> anyway, he said, Mom, I'm going to uh, be released from prison. I'm going to take the train that comes by the family farm. He said, if you and Dad forgive me and you give me a new chance, I'd like you to tie a piece of yellow ribbon on the oak tree beside the train tracks. And if I'm on that train and I see that ribbon, <coughs> I'll know that I can jump off that train and I, that I've been forgiven. He said, if I don't see that yellow ribbon, he said, I'm going to stay on that train. I'll never come home again, and you'll never hear from me again. Well, the day of his release from jail, he walked down to the train station, he bought a ticket, and he got on the train. But every turn of the wheels of that locomotive, his tension mounted and his worry got worse. He was just wondering if that piece of ribbon was going to be in that tree. <coughs> <coughs> and as the train rounded the bend, approaching the family farm, he couldn't stand to look at it. So he asked this guy across the aisle, and he said, Sir, he said, would you mind coming to the window and look out the window to see if you see a ribbon in that big tree down here? He said, it's my family farm, and I want to know if there's a ribbon in that tree. The man said, no. I said, uh, I don't mind. I'll do that for you. So he comes over and he looks out the window. He says, hey, he said, uh, do you see a ribbon? Do you see a ribbon? The man said, no. No, I don't see a ribbon. He said, I see hundreds of ribbon tied to every branch. I see ribbons tied to the clothesline. I see ribbons on the rose bushes all along down the fence. They even have roses on the scarecrow. So it looked like it snowed at that farm and it snowed yellow ribbons. <coughs> the man asked the boy, he says, what did it mean? Well, the boy jumped off the train. He said, well, it means I've been forgiven and that there's a new beginning with my mother and my father. <coughs> well, obviously, I got to quit right there, but 
<laughs> what I want to tell you this morning, what this story tells us is that love forgives. And if you can't think of any other reason this morning to tell God that you love him, to thank him, tell him, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for all you've done for me. <clears throat> thank you for watching over me. But most of all, thank you for watching over me and blessing me all the days of my life. If God's been good to you, tell somebody, God, before you leave here this morning that, that uh, I know that God's been good to me. <clears throat> and I know that down through the years, the Lord has been good to me. We're going to stand and sing hymn number 504 as our invitation this morning. <coughs> If you need to come to the altar this morning, tell God how much you love him, <clears throat> how much you thank him for the goodness to you down through all the years of your life, you come as we sing this morning. <laughs>